Welcome to using PowerShell in a cross-platform world. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, and just as a thank you, I'm gonna leave that pun up on the slide. I won't say it out loud. You guys, you know, you, you'll have to work a little harder if you wanna boo me there. Uh, so some of you may have noticed, I'm not James Pogren. <laughs> James Pogren uh, is the smart guy that originally came up with this talk, got it pitched, put all the smart bits together, uh, and then he had a personal thing where he couldn't show up and then through um, an act of organizational nepotism, basically, I'm here to give you this talk instead. He's a teammate of mine. All of those things on the slide up there about us are true, uh, and I'll just trust that you've read them by now. Um, we have some PowerShell release history to go over, or at least we did uh, when I was making this slide, but thanks to the keynotes, they've covered most of this for me. Uh, so we can kind of breeze through uh, most of this. The only thing that I really do want to touch on here is the uh, experimental features. Who, is anybody familiar with experimental features in PowerShell yet? Great. Experimental features, look into them, get dash experimental feature uh, if you're in PowerShell core. These are a really awesome way for the PowerShell team to release new functionality to us without actually having to like fully support it yet. They can kind of gather feedback. And the one that I want to talk about is the temp drive. I know this is early and we're kind of diving into it, but one of the experimental uh, features is the temp drive. Uh, when you start to move your stuff over into Linux, sometimes you know you need to write a temp file, scratch file, something like that, and you could end up with um, not a lot of it, but a little bit of boilerplate code in a lot of your scripts uh, that you have to kind of repeat and maybe even template, whatever. Use the experimental feature, use the temp drive. If you're coming from Pester, this is gonna be really familiar. Just let the language figure out where to put those temp files. Um, the speed improvements, the speed improvements uh, for PowerShell core are really big. I help run the uh, Portland PowerShell user group and we had Yacht Brasser on a little while ago to demo some of those uh, speed improvements because PowerShell 6 has really been focusing on, on speed improvements and some of this stuff is eye popping. Uh, PowerShell 5.1, they did a, a background job sort of demo task that took a minute 30. Uh, PowerShell 6x background jobs cut it in half and then thread jobs are standard in PowerShell 6, and that took it down to 300 milliseconds. Like, we're less than a third of a second on the same task just by going to PowerShell 6, and we're not even cross-platform yet. So that stuff's, uh, you know, really exciting. And then PowerShell uh, 7, notice the dropped core. I don't know anything about, uh, more about that than you do at this point, thanks to the keynotes. Thanks, you know, for, to them for putting that out there. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it. You know, I hope you, you are too. It's based on uh, PowerShell and .NET Core, thus uh, the core in the name. We won't focus a whole lot about that uh, unless you have uh, questions about it. You can, you know, you can, you can uh, talk to me offline, but it's a small, smaller version of .NET Core so we can go cross-platform and enjoy all this goodness on uh, Linux and Mac. Uh, but as some of you know, there are things that are missing because it's on .NET Core, so some of those APIs are gone. Uh, which means that some of those modules can't be used. And I, I know that I get a lot of feedback when I talk to people about PowerShell Core that they say, well, I'd love to use it, but Active Directory isn't there for me. And, and I have to use Active Directory in my, in my daily uh, workflows. We'll see in just a little bit that that's not entirely hopeless, but as of now, it is gone. Uh, some of you may uh, have noticed that in the PowerShell 7 announcement, the idea is to bring a lot of those back. Um, so kind of hold out hope, and, and again, there's a technique that we can use to get some of those back uh, anyway. This is also different. Some of you may have noticed already, PowerShell uh, Core, especially uh, you know, when you start to get into cross-platform, it's not actually called PowerShell.exe anymore, it's pwsh.exe. Uh, there's a link in the slide deck, um, in the notes, the speaker notes, to the discussion about how and why this happened. But the short version is that PowerShell Core has enough breaking changes with PowerShell 5 that especially if you aren't cross-platform yet, if you're using PowerShell Core on Windows, you don't want to invoke PowerShell and have like ambiguity about which version of PowerShell you're gonna get. You don't want to accidentally get PowerShell 5. And if you construct your path variable in just the right way and if they didn't do this uh, name change, you could run into situations like that where your script would accidentally run on PowerShell Core and, and things would break and, everybody would be confused and angry, so pwsh.exe. This was the slide I was originally gonna talk about PowerShell 7. This is all stuff that you, get, that you know uh, by now. Uh, if you have more questions, does anybody have questions about that? Great, so we can just kind of move on. 
Why choose PowerShell? I, this is gonna seem a little bit obvious to people in a PowerShell conference, but the real question here <laughs> is why choose PowerShell for your cross-platform scripting needs, right? Because there are other uh, cross-platform scripting languages out there, clearly there's Ruby, there's uh, Python, there's Node, and they have their advantages, but I think PowerShell has a lot of particular advantages that a lot of us here are gonna be uh, interested in. So one of the big ones to me is that PowerShell is designed as a shell and a scripting language. And a lot of these other languages, they, they, they might have a command line interpreter, but they're not designed as a shell. Like you would never use the Ruby um, uh, IRB as your shell. It's just not a good experience. And it's the same with uh, Python interpreters and that kind of thing. That's not a shell. PowerShell is a shell and a scripting language. There, there's almost complete parity between the two. Uh, so as operations people, like a lot of us are, we're not software developers or operations people that fiddle with stuff until it works. Well, you can take all that fiddling and stick it in a script and expect that it's gonna work. And that's really, really powerful. Uh, especially for other co people coming from other languages that aren't used to that experience. When they start to see how powerful that can be, um, you know, they, they really start to like it. Remoting, a lot of these other languages aren't gonna do uh, remoting the way PowerShell does. Um, we just had a remoting talk, I think it was yesterday, but having the remoting capability in your shell, whether you're on Windows or Linux, I mean, that, that's really big, having a consistent remoting experience and being able to take some of those remoting uh, techniques and put them in your scripts. Remoting is really, really big. I, I really like to point this one out because a lot of us here in, in this room, of course, have invested a lot of time into learning PowerShell or, or you're on that journey, right? And as knowledge workers, that time that we uh, spend learning a new technology, that's one of the most uh, precious resources that we have. You're not getting that time back. You could have learned other things. So learning these new skills in is incredibly important. And when you start to take these PowerShell skills and apply them to entirely new platforms, I mean, that is a really, really big win. You can start to take existing skills and apply them to just this whole other uh, field of endeavor. Now these other languages do have disadvantages. Uh, I'm going to talk about them, but I just want to point out that I'm not bashing these other languages. Uh, I don't need like mean tweets afterward, Bill doesn't like Ruby, uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. But you know, we'll just hit on a couple of them. They can be difficult to use and install. Uh, some of them have uh, installers, MSI installers, they might even have a package, but uh, getting the rest of the environment set up can be pretty bulky and, and it's not a great experience. Um, then once you're up and running, sometimes the ecosystem is hostile. There's uh, really commonly used packages that the rest of the ecosystem is using, but then you try to use them on Windows on you know, cross-platform code and it's broken because they didn't really design it with Windows in mind. They didn't test it on Windows, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, so now that we've decided to use PowerShell, I'll just assume you've decided to use PowerShell cross-platform, uh, how do you go ahead and get started doing that? Well, PowerShell Core uh, is just an application that you install on the system. It's not like it used to be where you had to do a whole new server version, right? So installing PowerShell on all of the platforms is all about the package manager, which means that it's super easy. A lot of you already know that on macOS, that's all you gotta do, and, and you're up and running. On Linux, I'm just gonna to admit to you that I'm cheating a little bit. There's a little bit of setup code you need to do for each of these repositories before you can run that command, and which package manager you're using is going to you know, change a little bit depending on your distro. But as soon as you do that little bit of setup, you can just do install. And this is another one, by the way. Uh, in the speaker notes is a link to the specific directions to do the setup, so you don't have to kind of take my word for it. The, the link to the documentation is right there. Uh, when you go to the to the repository. And on Windows, it's that easy as well. You just do Choco install. I, I understand that a lot of you are not using Chocolaty or you're in an environment where Chocolaty is, is you know, not in use yet. You know, you can't, get it, uh, you can't get it installed. So you could also just do that. This is, uh, full disclosure, a script that I stole from a Steve Lee tweet. <laughs> and the only point here is that Power, installing PowerShell Core is so easy that it fits in a tweet. It's just something that I, I thought was uh, interesting. So 
Uh, PowerShell core cross-platform is good at some things. It's not quite as good at other things. So one of the things that it is really good at is interacting with web services. D does anybody here go to Kevin Marquette's talk about um, the web commandlets? Yeah, great. I had originally a slide where I was going to talk about the web commandlets, but I'm just going to tell you ahead of time, you're not going to get it any better than you're going to get from Mark Krauss. He wrote some of that stuff. So um, I do encourage you to learn more about them if you're interested in, in PowerShell Core. Please look at the YouTube videos uh, uh, later on. I won't touch on them too much. But if you're interacting with web services, even if you're not cross-platform yet, the web commandlets are so much better in PowerShell Core that it's worth the move up to Core just for the web commandlets. Especially if you're dealing with open source and cross-platform products, even from Windows, a lot of them behave in open sourcey ways that aren't going to make the older web service commandlets happy. So if you're running into problems, try, try Core, look at the new uh, switch parameters that are available. You're really going to like it. It's really good at data conversion. So if you're hitting REST endpoints with JSON and you're doing it from Linux, maybe um, you know, your Linux admins are doing it, ask them how they do it, right? There's a good chance they're using curl and then they're piping all this stuff over to like maybe JQ or, or something like that. PowerShell is so much better at this. You can hit the REST endpoints, you're gonna get PowerShell objects uh, back, you can write the PowerShell objects out to JSON or XML or whatever. PowerShell is really helping you abstract away even the, the fact that you're dealing with some of these languages. You can just deal with the objects and, and worry about the output and input formats uh, you know, later. It's gonna make it a lot, a lot easier. Uh, Cross-platform PowerShell is great for build scripts. So if you have an open source project that, that you're working on, maybe you're maintaining it, maintaining it internally, and you wanna start interacting with that project on Windows, you know, maybe it already has a build.sh script. These build.sh scripts in a lot of cases are very difficult to understand. Um, they're configured with environment variables and, and they're not gonna work very well on Windows. You know, it's hard to execute build.sh on Windows, right? Give it a, a PowerShell build script and everybody's gonna be able to use it cross-platform. You're gonna be able to wrap things in functions. You're gonna get parameter completion. You're gonna get all of that. You might get a little bit of resistance from your Linux guys, but just show them the light a little bit. I, I know it's, it's harder than that, but uh, everybody will like life better. Uh, Pester, Pester is cross-platform. Pester is so good uh, that it's worth calling out on its own, especially when you consider the fact that on Linux, you can start to use Pester for things like uh, system validation. So you can take various aspects of the system state, run it through a Pester test, and get uh, validation that your system is in the state that you expect it to be in. And then you can do things like take all of those tests, I expect these files here, I expect these uh, Nginx settings to be this way, whatever, and when your tests are done, you can output that test to things like NUnit XML files, suck them up into other places. I mean, there's just a whole world of possibilities there. There are things that it's not the best at just yet. Uh, one of them is um, reaching its fingers into the operating system. And, and the, the thing to note here is that PowerShell was designed as it, to, to work with an operating system that is API based. And it's designed to work with one operating system's API, not necessarily you know, a, a whole bunch of them. So there are things like the get, the get service commandlets aren't there. Uh, if you're using transactions in PowerShell, you know, that's not there. It, you, you're gonna have to do kind of a lot of manual uh, file system kind of stuff if you wanna do those kinds of things. WinForms isn't there, so you know interfaces are kind of out. Uh, this is just a minor thing. If you're doing things like you're piping ls to grep and you expect that colorized output, uh, maybe it's just the shells that I'm using or the, the sessions that I'm using. I don't get that colorized output. It's kind of sad. Um, so now what is it like to use this thing on a daily basis? Well, for the most part, PowerShell is gonna try to behave the same as it does on Windows, but it is trying to be a good citizen on Linux. So things are stored in slightly different places. Uh, this slide is gonna show you, um, you know, some of the places where it's keeping things, but I think one of the main things to take from this slide is that you don't have to memorize all of the places where those things are. The environment PS module path variable is still there. The profiles um, variable is still there. So you can still do, if you wanted to, something like uh, vim uh, profiles.currentuser all hosts, and, and you'll get it. Uh, even if it differs from distro to distro, you, you don't have to memorize all that stuff. The language is helping you. 
Uh, this slide here is kind of showing you that get child item is operating the same as it, as it does on Windows. It's gonna work just fine on, on Linux. But in this example, I've taken a file and I've marked it as executable. And get child item isn't gonna show that to you. Uh, get child item is just gonna show you all the things that it knows how to show you. And you know, there's properties that, it, that aren't being displayed there. But it doesn't really have a concept of executable because the place where it comes from doesn't have that concept. So you're gonna need to use ls to get that executable bit. And the only point here is that PowerShell is operating the same, but you are on a different platform. So you're not totally off the hook for learning something about Linux. You, you do still need to learn about something about the place where you're running. Uh, and also, uh, on the subject of running it uh, as your daily driver on the, um, for your daily use, how do you make sure that PowerShell is the shell that you use on a daily basis? And to do that, what I have here is I have a, um, a terminal that's ready to SSH into an Ubuntu machine on which I've already installed PowerShell. And when I SSH into it, you'll see that I'm in a bash shell. That's not really what I want on a, on a daily basis. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna confirm that uh, PWSH is available as a shell, because it is. You can make that your daily driver shell if you want to. But what you can see there is that I've got two copies of PWSH. And the question is, which one of those do I want to use? Well, if we look at the properties of the user bin PWSH, uh, what we'll see is that it's not actually there. It's just a sim link to the opt copy that uh, Microsoft put there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to change our default shell. I'm going to change my default shell to the user bin copy, the one that's sim linked. And then as the machine's life cycle goes on and we do system updates maybe, uh, updates to the PowerShell version, the sim link will get updated to the new version. And everybody that has their uh, default shells pointed at the sim link, their shells are still gonna be okay. They're gonna get the new version by default. So that's kind of what, what that's there for. Um, uh, Linux likes to do a lot of this kind of sim linking stuff. Windows admins, we're not really used to it. Um, get child item, by the way, has actually been improved to uh, handle sim linking properly. It, our initial versions we used to try to follow sim links like all the way down. It, it won't do that anymore. You're okay. This command is just changing the shell for my user. I'm logged in as root. Uh, so it's just my user. So if you have uh, Unix admins on the box, you're not going to ruin their day. You know, you can just do it for, your, for yourself. And what you'll see is now that I'm logged back in, PowerShell is the place where I land. And when I exit out, uh, you'll see that I, I don't exit out to bash, I exit out you know, back to my host box. So this is uh, a way that you can make sure that on a daily basis when you land in your Linux boxes that PowerShell is where you're at. Uh, so here's where I get to talk about various places that uh, James and I and, and other people have kind of stubbed our toes about uh, the move up to, up to Linux. These are just kind of gotchas that we've run into. One of them is environment variables. Environment variables uh, on Linux, by default, are all uppercase. And if you iterate over the environment drive uh, in PowerShell on Linux, you'll see that they're all uppercase, except for that one. That one. That's, that's a special case. That's our, that's our, our special uh, case right there. And the reason is that a lot of authors, when they were moving their stuff, environment variables are case sensitive. They're not on Windows, they are on Linux. They're case sensitive. And so people would move their scripts and their scripts would start to fail. They would get nulls from that one because they missed. And so the team decided that there was enough of this going on that they said, okay, fine, we give up and we'll do the camel case on, on Linux. So that, that's, that's the only one that you'll find. And there's a link to the, uh, in the speaker notes to the whole discussion you know, uh, about how that happened. But um, it was just to avoid all these pedantic little edits. You just can go ahead and use it. Module names are another special case. If you're in Linux and you do import module just name, case insensitive. But if you give the uh, full path to a module, that's case sensitive. And again, there's a link to a bunch of discussion. This was a little bit controversial because modules are backed intrinsically by file directories. But the team made the decision that it just this is just a little too fiddly to have um, case sensitivity if you just want to use uh, the name. Nobody wants to have to remember that kind of case sensitivity, especially since no, so many modules on the forge are like this weird camel case everywhere because we're used to that case insensitivity. So if you're doing module development though, and your, uh, your working directory is somewhere else on the disk, it's not on your uh, module path, so you provided the path to your module development area, it, that's gonna be case sensitive. 
They're different modules. Because on, on Linux, if, if you, they're totally different directories. So that, in that case, if you're only using the module name, right, then it's based on the environment PS module path, and it's going to be whichever comes up first, right. Platform variables. Platform variables are not case sensitive because they're regular, uh, they're regular variables. Uh, but the thing is that they're so Im important, I want to touch on them here because you can do things like this. And this goes to um, strategies for the maintainability of, of your code, right? And I want to give a shout out real quick to Tyler Leonard who gave me the idea for this particular switch construct. It had not occurred to me to use a switch uh, in quite this way. But the idea here is if you are authoring a module, right, and, and a lot of us are authoring modules with a con uh, uh, an idea where you have public commandlet function definitions and then you have all the private plumbing stuff, uh, you know, in a private folder, right? Your public implementation should read very much like a series of English sentences, you know, to the degree possible. When I talk about these things, it's all ideal world. I know no nothing is quite perfect. But things should read like an English sentence top to down and it should be really easy to figure out what's going on. But when you start to get into cross platforms, sometimes doing the same task will have different implementations on the two platforms. If you need to get a particular piece of data, you won't do it on the, in the same way. And so your public implementation should just say, get piece of awesome data, um, right? And then in the private uh, backing script, it should have this construct. And what you'll have is if you're on Windows, it should say, get piece of awesome data from Windows. And then Linux, get piece of awesome data from Linux. This becomes especially important as the complexity and the differences between the two platforms become you know, more and more divergent. Because if you try to, to munge all this together into a single script and it's all interleaved, this is a, a maintainability nightmare in, in the making. Because if you have one difference in implementation, like you know, Ubuntu comes out with a new version and you've got to do something different, now you've got to dig through this whole big private thing where everything is mixed together, you know, and you might like contaminate your Windows results in a variable. Like you just don't want to be in that world. So this this construct right here is really going to help you make sure that you have the separation of concerns in your private implementations, that all of your logic is nice and separate and, and easy to maintain. But the platform variables are a little bit coarse. You're going to know that you're on Linux, but you're not necessarily going to know that you're on Ubuntu or, or something like that. Uh, and this one, full disclosure, I stole from a Mark Krauss <laughs> script uh, that he wrote quite some time ago. Some of you may see already that it's not necessarily up to date. There's a link to the script in the, in the notes. But this is just kind of an idea of a pattern that you can use to get more detailed information from the operating system. And I especially want to uh, point out the convert from string uh, commandlet right there. That is new to PowerShell core. You get it on Windows as well. And the win here is that some of us are in a cross-platform world, not in the sense that we're logging into the Linux, but in the sense that some of these Linuxy products are starting to do things on our Windows boxes. So you're starting to get these Linuxy types of files on our Windows machines. And that's what this commandlet is intended to help you out with, you know, among other things, is to parse those, you know, value equal or key equals value, key equals value type, you know, very generic files. So if you need to get information about the open source product that's running on your Windows machine, you can start to pipe that content into that thing right there, uh, and you can get that kind of information uh, really easily. File encoding becomes a problem. Uh, especially if you're taking uh, scripts that have a long life. If you have a script that maybe started its life in the PowerShell 3 days, it, it was originally author authored on ISE, that kind of thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just going to take a, a quick pause here. Does anybody have any questions, by the way? I feel like I'm moving kind of fast. Great. Uh, so if your scripts have that kind of long lifetime, you may not even notice yet that they're UTF-16 encoded. And I call that out specifically because UTF-16 encoding is going to cause problems on Linux. Uh, Windows, that was the default encoding for a while because of international characters and, and whatever. Linux is UTF-8 only, basically. If you're in that world, just use UTF-8. I put ASCII up there. We can talk about offline if you, if you want to get geeky enough to talk about the difference, but just, just use UTF-8. Um, so how do you know if you're going to have an issue with that? 
uh, you, there's lots of commands that you can use out there. They're mostly um, implementations on Stack Overflow and that kind of thing. Don't go reinventing the wheel. If you look at the uh, slide deck um, on your own computer, that's a clickable link to a Lee Holmes implementation of one of these commandlets that will help you out. Just fair warning, if you have a fairly generic file, it's an ASCII file, and you use the Lee Holmes script, sometimes it'll tell you that it's UTF-7. That's okay. UTF-7 is fine. It's probably just ASCII or, or UTF-8. Don't worry about it. Uh, but having an issue looks like this. Uh, the first screenshot up there is just to let you know that you're not necessarily going to see visually in your editor that you're about to have a problem. But that second screenshot, when you, when you look down there, that's the right, lower right-hand side of Visual Studio Code. And you'll see up there that it does say UTF-16. And then that's just a hex dump. We won't talk about it. But the last screenshot there is one of the examples of the kinds of problems that you can run into. When you start to do cross-platform uh, workflows, a lot of times you're talking about Git workflows. And Git has issues with UTF-16. If you change two lines in a file and you try to do a Git diff, it's going to say, nope, that's binary. Well, I can see clearly that it's not binary Git, thanks. Well, it's because, it, it's, because it's UTF-16 and it doesn't really know what's going on with that. So to fix it, there's a couple good ways to fix it. One is to actually, you can click on that UTF-16 right there. And what you're going to get is that menu right there. When you get that menu, click on Save as a Different Encoding. The menu that pops down is going to ask you which encoding that you want. ASCII is not even an option. Just click UTF-8, and it will convert it for you. That second one, of course, uh, doing it in the GUI is not always uh, real feasible. So if you have lots of files, you know you're going to have an issue. Just start to treat them on the command line that way. Just fair warning. The, the assignment to a variable and, and the lack of piping from one to the other is deliberate. I don't know if, how, how many people have run into this before, but you can't pipe from a get to a set on the same file. Uh, get content is going to start piping stuff through before it's actually done. So you've locked your own file. So you're going to have to assign to a variable first and, and then do it. You can prevent it with a number of different strategies. We won't spend uh, too much time on them, but uh, there's things that you can do, especially if you know you're going to be doing a lot of out file and set content and that kind of thing. You can set uh, defaults uh, if you want to. Um, using modern editors is good if you're starting a new file. If you do file new in modern versions of ISE and VS Code, you're going to get UTF-8. It won't help you so much if you have those long-lived scripts that are already UTF-16. Line endings. Some of us already know that line endings are different between Linux and Windows. And these will trip you up in kind of unexpected ways. And the reason they're unexpected is because Windows already knows how to accept Linux line endings in most places now. Uh, I think Notepad's been modified to, to take them. VS Code uh, will accept them. I think ISC, I'm not sure, uh, will accept them. But the point here is that Windows and Microsoft are, are the ones kind of moving in that direction. Linux is not. Linux is making no effort to accept CRLF line endings. And if you accidentally put CRLF line endings in things, uh, things, will, things will start to break. So what you can do about that is you can use VS Code to convert. Uh, if you go back to the screenshot before right there, to the right of UTF-16, it says CRLF. You can do the same thing. You click on it, and it'll, it'll offer to convert it for you. Uh, and you can also convert it in, uh, on the command line. We won't, uh, won't go too much on that. But you know, <laughs> it's really not worth fighting about. If you're going to be doing cross-platform uh, scripting, you're going to be doing cross-platform uh, projects, just go ahead and use Linux line endings. Uh, you'll do the conversion once. You'll never notice the difference. Uh, paths. PowerShell is accepting the Linux paths everywhere now. Uh, almost, any, almost anything you can do in PowerShell, you can use that forward slash because PowerShell is doing path normalization everywhere. It's taking the, whatever paths that you path, pass in, that's a tongue twister, uh, and it's going to tokenize it and it's going to build that, uh, that path for you. If you're doing a lot of cross-platform, you might even save yourself a little headache and just start using you know, the, the forward slash on your command line so you don't have to do that mental switching. Uh, but there's no reason to get like sticky about your backslashes or to have to like do some sort of string conversion. Am I on Windows? This this path separator just just don't bother. Uh, join path is also your friend here uh, because join path is going to let you programmatically uh, build paths that are native to the platform that you're on. 
It's also worth noting here that that uh, additional paths parameter, that's new to PowerShell 6. Uh, the old uh, joint paths didn't used to have that, so you had to do, if you're building deep paths, you had to do like some pre-processing or, or whatever you're gonna do, uh, but it got that uh, with uh, PowerShell Core. Aliases are not your friends. So some of us have been saying for quite a while, please don't use aliases in your scripts. Um, and it's just kind of getting worse, uh, the situation for aliases. They're mostly going away. This is a list of aliases that are already gone. Some of those you already know are gone. LS and curl, those were pretty controversial and everybody was pretty happy to see those gone. <laughs> they were causing a lot of problems. Sort and select took some people by surprise. Uh, those felt safe because sort and select didn't correspond to binaries that were on either system, but just to let you know, they are gone. So if you're gonna take your scripts, and even if you're not going cross-platform, if you're just going up to PowerShell 6, you're gonna run into syntax errors with that, because that's not actually a thing anymore. So please don't use uh, aliases. Um, this is a list of aliases that, as of the version I was running, are still there. And these are kind of dangerous, like kill up there is a binary on the system, but it's been aliased uh, to a commandlet. Uh, what is it? Echo uh, is aliased. Uh, so especially if you are, uh, if you start to evangelize this to Linux people, you say, hey, PowerShell's great, you should try it. And they try it and they want to use kill and they have a bad day, like they're not going to like you too much, but you know, at, at least be prepared, prepared for it. I will say that there's a link in the, in the um, speaker notes as well to the discussion about how to get rid of aliases from the language completely. Uh, please don't despair though, you'll be able to get it back in the command line. Um, the, I don't think anybody's gonna pull the trigger on that without a way to get them back in your command line. Uh, but from the scripted environment, I, I don't count on any of them being there. It's worth notice that, noting that uh, some commandlets have changed their implementation between five and six. Uh, and this will uh, start to hit you pretty bad if you are doing cross-platform stuff, but some of you might notice even if you're not. Um, so this is um, uh, an example where the encoding parameter, like the encoding parameter still exists, but you might notice that on the lower uh, list of available encodings that byte is gone. Uh, you can no longer do encoding byte to get the raw bytes of a file, because if you think about it, byte is not an encoding. It's just you know an output stream. So they changed the way the commandlet works, and now you have a flag on there as byte stream. So now if you want to accomplish the task of getting the raw bytes of a file, you know, get content is still there. It's not like it's a different commandlet, but the way that you call it has changed. And so this is uh, uh, something that's changed between the two versions, but you could get a lot of uh, different uh, differences like these when you go across platform. You know, when uh, the platform has changed, so the way that you need to call a commandlet has changed as well. And so, splatting to the rescue. This is where you're using the, uh, the platform variables to decide the way that you should call the commandlet, even though the commandlet itself hasn't changed. If you're not using splatting yet, by the way, uh, please do, highly recommend. Uh, by the way, that's a new platform variable. We haven't seen that yet in the slideshow, is core CLR. This is a valid uh, platform variable for uh, PowerShell Core on Windows as well, and it's your clue that you're running in PowerShell Core and not 5.1. Uh, so even if you're running on PowerShell Core on Windows, that is Core CLR is true because you're in the Core CLR. So you can, you can tell the difference there. Uh, who, who's familiar with shebangs, is anybody? Yeah, this is kind of a new term to me. I, I just, and I kind of giggled. I still kind of giggle shebang, I don't know. <laughs> But this is a way to uh, natively tell uh, Linux type operating systems which uh, interpreter that you want to use to execute a file. Because a lot of times on Linux, a file is executable, but it doesn't have an extension. That's not how Linux tells you know, how to do things. There's no extension. So they use the shebang up there. And what happens is when the file is uh, marked as executable, that is up there to tell the system, OK, when I execute this file, who's going to execute it for me? And a lot of times when you see that, it's gonna be bash, it's gonna be bin bash or whatever. But you can do the same thing with PWSH. And so you have a file on the system with a bunch of PowerShell code in it. That's just a comment, it's not gonna break your code. But you stick it at the top and then when you mark your script executable, then even if you're in bash, you can just invoke the name of the script and it's gonna run. PWSH was specifically modified to enable this behavior. If you do PowerShell.exe, what is it, dash dash help or slash question mark or whatever you do, 
and then you do PW, the same thing to PWSH, you'll see that the uh, command line parameter order has changed specifically to enable that. And it's super useful for Git hooks. Super useful for Git hooks. Uh, this is how you can ensure that your uh, PowerShell script is your Git hook. And Git hooks are this great way so that if you do something like you want to have a Git workflow, when somebody commits, you can have a Git hook that ensures that all of your linter rules are okay and that all of your pester tests pass. And if they don't, nope, you're not doing a commit because the Git hook commit you know, script has, has said so. But you can only get that to run even on Windows if you have the shebang right. And by the way, uh, to get back to line endings, the only way to get that shebang right is to have a Linux line ending uh, at the end of it. If you have a Windows line ending at the end of the shebang, even if you're on Windows, it's broken. It's not going to work. And uh, you know, if you don't know that ahead of time, you might be sad for a little while until Stack Overflow finally, finally tells you what's going on. Uh, so I hope I didn't go through too fast, uh, but that is most of my presentation. Um, I hope you got it, uh, some value out of it, and if you have any questions, you know, I'm going to tell you I don't know. So, oh yeah, so the question is, what does the p-invoke story look like on PowerShell Core? Has anybody used p-invoke before? Yeah? So, th so the answer, by the way, in, additional, in addition to the question was, uh, the p-invoke story on Linux looks great. You can do the same thing. You can invoke the same C libraries, is that? Yeah, well, you can invoke. Right, so if you have a C library on Linux, you can, you can import the thing in p-invoke and, and you're, still, you're still a happy person. Oh, so what sort of stuff am I using PowerShell Core for? So I started to look into using a Go um, project because one of our administrators needed to modify the way that VMware built firmware for our Windows machines that we were deploying over there. And the, the utility that he was using was a compiled utility written in Go, uh, and we helped him with it. But the build script for that project was extremely frustrating. The build script was, it's not even that it was super long, it's that it was only configured by environment variables. Uh, you had to read the whole thing to figure out what the variables were, what they were doing, what are the available values, I don't know. Uh, so I wrote a, a build.psh for it, wrapped everything in parameters, you know, had the validate script with all the available values, everything, everything was nice, and uh, I was certainly a lot happier to use it. Yeah, so the question is when you're interacting with the cross-platform, um, you know, with the different platforms, um, do, are your private implementations packaging everything up into, into objects? Uh-huh. Right. Um, so I, I think the strategy that I would go with there would be a different script kind of per, per platform. But the thing is that when, you're, when you have like get awesome piece of data from Windows and get awesome piece of data from Linux, whatever you assign to this a variable between the two should be something that's consistent between the two of them. So whatever munging that you gotta do to the data before it gets back out to the variable, that, that's where you want the consistency to be. Because you want, uh, do you want all of the, the differences in the platforms to be hidden down here? And the rest of your script should have nice consistent expectations about the thing that it's going to get back. I think, so the question is, um, are you, are, is there anybody out there using the platform variables to separate out the logic kind of into separate files and, and treat them differently that way? Yeah, so I, I think that gets back to the public and private functions a little bit, where a lot of people, the, the, when they're mod, authoring their modules, like one tactic that a lot of the community likes to use is to use separate files for each function. Uh, and so your functions are getting separated out into the different uh, files. And then you can choose to, to compile those all into a big PSM1 if you want to, or you can dot source them in their separate state if you want to. Uh, but that kind of, it, it, to my head, in my head, that's kind of analogous to where your implementations are in separate files, and so you don't have to like, um, you know, clutter a single file with these, these differences in, in implementation. D does that answer your question? You know, <laughs> That's a good question, and that, that is a question that comes up. And there is a, a module, I think it had, doesn't have any commits for, a long, for quite a while, but there's, oh uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, is there one consistent way to deal with the clipboard across all of the, across all of the platforms? So there is a good module out there, and I think uh, Steve Lee publicly uh, recommended it to, to somebody, and it doesn't get a lot more from the horse's mouth, really. So I feel comfortable recommending it. I wish I knew the name off the top of my head. Is, is that what it is? 
Yeah, th so there's a whole module out there. Set clipboard text, I think, is one suggestion for what the name could be. Right. But the, but the, the implementation of how you interact with the clipboard, uh, and, and I think you know this already, but it is so different between the different platforms that, that this module is specifically built to uh, interact with the different binaries on the different platforms that you need to interact with in order to interact with the clipboard. So that does help um, you know, obfuscate that away from you. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for, for coming. Did I come in under time somehow? Okay. All right. Thanks.